Thank you, and uh, welcome. Uh, uh, when we thought of this panel, when uh, you know Ginny and a few of us were discussing this, uh, one of the, the suggestions we had is we have a lot of you know uh, nothing against Wall Street types or economists uh, sitting in uh, in uh, the U.S., which is what you know Arvind and uh, Subramaniam and I qualify as. But we wanted people uh, from India who are in the trenches. Uh, running businesses and have been there for a long time to be, you know, to be a part of the panel. And as it so happens, both Nivrati and uh, Naresh Trehan have been in the U.S. for a long time and then made the decision to go back to India and have successfully uh, been spearheading, uh, you know, the different businesses. So they bring a, a perspective which I think is going to be, you know, quite interesting. Oh, wow, the lights are really, really strong. But anyway, uh, we, uh, can we turn those lights on just a little bit? I don't think we need to be seen quite as clearly. Uh, it's a little blinding. I think it's a little two blinding. Other ones. Uh, but uh, I'll start with the first question, which is kind of the genesis of this idea of doing this panel, which is, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk of China plus one, India's decade, manufacturing, you know, Apple is opening a manufacturing facility, other chip companies are coming to India, uh, other manufacturing, but clearly the technology side is where India seems to be focusing. And Nivruti, you're you know, uh, obviously involved in that a lot. So maybe you can start us off by telling us about how real is this opportunity and what are the challenges in seizing this opportunity? Because as we all know, India's you know, had a few misses along the way in terms of opportunities that have come along. Absolutely, so let me start with there's a huge amount of tailwinds that India is experiencing. And uh, if we play our cards right, this is the time. And this is the time not just for India to grow, but India to enable the world to grow. So let me just tell you the local companies and the global companies. From local companies' perspective, uh, you know, companies like Tata, uh, they have uh, you know, tried to grow inorganically, like acquired Vistron, for example, for manufacturing. Uh, Vistron will enable them to do printed circuit boards, a lot that go into the semiconductor devices. The other company is Reliance, which has acquired Sanmina India, again trying to get into manufacturing. So India absolutely knows that you know the 8 million jobs that they have to create, by the way, World Economic Forum says in the next decade, India has to create 8 million jobs. If India has to create 8 million jobs, then manufacturing has to be a key segment. And with that awareness, the local companies are trying to make this effort. Now, what's happening with the global companies? Apple is a beautiful example of what Apple did in nine months. And with the promise of building 25% of their phones out of India. Cisco is planning the investment of about you know a billion dollars. So many such international companies are looking at leveraging India for three primary reasons. People, very digitally trained people, you know, 500 million or so people available for work. Second is the digitalization and the platform and the open uh, platform efforts that the government is driving. One of them is, you know, you are, many of you are familiar with is unified payment interface. And the third thing is this geopolitics and the change that India is trying to drive in awareness of supply chain. So my gut feeling is this is the time now. The last thing I want to say is, because I come from semiconductor industry, I'm representing women, I'm representing technology, and I'm representing India. So in semiconductor space, Arvind and I were talking, Arvind, uh, the chief economic advisor to India and in the past, we were talking about you know, what are the challenges. I'm really excited about India trying to build a semiconductor fab, but let me tell you the challenges. To build a semiconductor fab and a moderate size fab, and we call it a fab with two mods, two lines, it requires um, 150,000 people's worth of drinking water daily. Second, it requires land, which is 250 acres. And you're all aware, you know, a soccer field is about two, two acres. So 125 uh, soccer fields is a moderate size fab. Lastly, it requires about 350 megawatt of power, which translates into 350,000 homes powered up in US and a million homes 
powered in India. So these are the challenges. Having highlighted the challenges, and you know, I have played a critical role in making sure that the government understands fab is not just fab itself, it requires the whole ecosystem. So in terms of power, there's a lot of focus on clean energy, renewable energy. You know, so far, fossil fuels are 50, 60% of India's, uh, you know, um, power uh, generation. But India is looking at, you know, 20, 30% renewable going to, uh, you know, 20, 40, 50% renewables. So that's the plan India is working on. In terms of water, a brand new ministry established. How can we, you know, enable water? And then in terms of land, there's a lot of incentives state government and central government, you know, are trying to put. So our journey for India is going to be crawl, walk, run. And very recently, when Gina Raimondo and Piyush Kohl signed an MOU, we were put together to talk about what are the strengths of India, plus also not forget what are the challenges India is facing. So we are coming up with solutions which you know incorporate both these and look at India to power the world. That's my answer. Thank, thank you, uh, Nivruti. Uh, I uh, think that. Uh, We'll, uh, before we come to Arvind Subramaniam, I want to uh, get uh, Naresh's views on uh, the healthcare, which is something that doesn't get mentioned, uh, you know, when people talk about the India opportunity as much as it should. Uh, and given what the lessons that I've learned from COVID, given the new move uh, with Ayushman Bharat, which is the Indian uh, government's uh, insurance scheme for, you know, uh, for all Indians. Uh, uh, I would like to understand what are the challenges and opportunities for India from a healthcare standpoint, uh, and 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 how is it positioned to, you know, seize the moment, and is there opportunities uh, there that uh, that and the challenges. To start with, you know, our population is four times that of the United States, and. So sitting here you realize that even the 350 million Americans are a challenge for the government or the private sector to provide uniform health care. So it's around the world, you look at Europe, same problem. So India with this population has a larger problem to actually tackle. But that's at four levels. One is at the primary or wellness centers. Then comes from there the mid-level, not secondary care, but mid-level level health care facilities. Then comes the secondary care and then tertiary care. So there at four levels we have to tackle this problem. So I talk, you mentioned Ayushman. Ayushman is an attempt really to actually tackle this problem for the entire Indian population in times to come starting with 150,000 wellness centers. That means every five villages will have one wellness center. We are halfway through. 75,000 to 80,000 have already been built. Now, the good part about technology is that these wellness centers are full-time, live connected to the secondary center and also to the district hospital, hospitals, which are capable of delivering quite a reasonable standard of care. The only problem we've had is that numerically they're not enough to tackle the kind of population we have. So, what are we expecting from Ayushman? Ayushman is covering 500 million people who were out of the healthcare loop completely. So it's a, it's a very good uh, sort of movement from our government and also the culmination in the way everybody across the government and the private sector is participating in it. So once we have that wellness center to address disease or any health issues at that initial level where they don't get very sick, because this is what's happening today, that in the absence of proper primary care centers, that people get sick, they get sicker, they get sicker, and then they panic and run to the highest facility that they can find. So if you want to disrupt that chain and actually bring a, an order into it, this system that has been s proposed and hopefully will get executed within the next three to five years, I think India could be proud at that level 
that at the at the ground level we will have enough facilities available and connectivity available to treat people for first point of contact being the wellness center, second being the district level if they need any particular procedure, and then if there is disease like you know cancer which will require radiation therapy or complicated surgery, then that could be kicked up. But the government, now let's go back to how this structure is going to function. So the government, if today you look at the landscape, we are 60 to 65 percent of the services are provided by the private sector. So 35 to 40 percent, depending on the states, is provided by the <coughs> healthcare system, public healthcare system, which the government pays for. So now if you look at it, how do we move forward to, to service? Now don't forget, whatever we do, we are adding 25 million people to our population every year. That's one population of Australia. So the challenge gets actually, you run but you still find yourself standing still. So there are many, the birth rate is coming down. And we believe that if once the system works better and the counseling at the ground level for healthier families and nutrition is, takes place, that this trend will reverse itself even further. That means that growth of population will come down. It's come down from 2.5 to about less than, a little less than 2. And what role does the private sector play in all this? What do so you, now, you know, your that's company... So now, I'm defining now. So the government is well equipped and that's where, because they have the whole well established district, local block level government institutions available to them, that that should be left to the government and that's what today is happening. When it comes to secondary care and tertiary care, that becomes a little more complicated because not only do you need the infrastructure, you need the technology and you need the human capital. And if you look at it, data compared to what should be by WHO standards, we are about halfway there. We need to double our infrastructure, double the number of doctors and nurses and, and para paramedical personnel given it will take at least 10 years to do that. So challenge is huge, but for the first time we are addressing it comprehensively. So what the government is encouraging today is let the private sector take the upper end of the delivery system, the secondary and tertiary care and quaternary care. Let the government work at the base level and there are some proposals being discussed right now. So what without naming the the agencies from around the world because there are many who have made proposals of how to take India forward. One is if like ADB or IMF or World Bank is to support India in its journey for better health, let that money be given to private sector on a 20 year loan, then because the international rate is 8%, the government will subvent it by 3%. So actually the, the, the cost to the private provider will be 5%. 20 year loan so that you can pay back, but you will service the Ayushman patients. Correct. Now Ayushman patients, the two, two very critical parts of that is, what are the rates at which you have to deliver the service and whether the payment uh, schedule is actually adhered to because today they say within 15 days 70% of your payment should come and within three months you should get the full processing. So if, if the government can actually accomplish that, I think a very bright future for in Health India, not in the immediate uh, sort of future, you can't say two, three years, but I think another five to seven years we could actually achieve or get much closer to the goal. Great, thank you. Uh, because, uh, I'll just add, because the two most critical elements here are that the Indian doctors are actually very good when they're given the right environment to work in. So that element is there and the, and the nursing services, if they are properly trained, they perform as well as anybody in the world. So that's the baseline and I think we can build on it in times to come. Great. Well, Pratham does its little bit on nursing, but uh, uh, in terms of some of the uh, uh, training that we do for some of the 
uh, vocational. Uh, but uh, Arvind, uh, I want to turn to you about one other topic that I wanted to discuss, and you can also maybe address some of the points made here. But the, I, I was in India three months back, and everybody was raving, and they've been raving for a while now about the digital payment stack and about how this whole, and Nandan talks about it, that you know, other countries get this, you know, don't have this. India has a world-leading digital payment stack with UPI and everything else, which maybe you can explain for those who may not be aware what exactly is it that India has accomplished in that digital payment stack. And what is your perspective, what is the real opportunity versus what may be a little bit of a you know, hype. I don't know if it's hype or not. You, why don't you unpack it a little bit for us? Yeah. First of all, I want to thank the Asia Society in Pratham for uh, inviting uh, us to take part in this panel, uh, extremely interesting panel. Uh, I just want to say, reinforce something that, you know, uh, uh, all of you uh, should know that Pratham is, uh, you know, uh, such an amazing institution. Uh, the amount of work that it's done in India, uh, and it's become such a global icon in terms of how civil society and NGOs can actually deliver things at scale. So, so uh, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this is, event is really all about Pratham and about Madhav Chavan and, and Rukmini Banerjee and the amazing institution that they've created. So, um, you know, please uh, uh, open your pockets to Pratham generously and, and uh, you know, that would be the, the, the main... Uh, uh, aim of this exercise. Oh, well said. Uh, so, so uh, if you don't mind, you know, maybe in terms of unpacking this, uh, yeah. if you could just step back, because I think the title of this uh, panel is actually uh, worth uh, asking, you know, is this India's decade? And the question is this, you know, is this a question even worth asking at this stage? Or why is this question uh, being asked? And I think it is a legitimate question because I think there are two broad things that make this, you know, uh, euphoria about India, I mean, plausible. Uh, uh, for example, I would say on the internal side, um, uh, you've heard kind of the, the textural stuff from you know, IT and, and uh, health. Uh, I would say that in India, internally, what's giving rise to this hype, uh, this euphoria, are uh, three, I would say, three revolutions. Uh, one is the physical infrastructure revolution. If you read all the papers, all that's happening, whether it's rail, roads, uh, ports, uh, power, uh, India is making great leaps uh, uh, and strides. Um, it began uh, under Mr. Vajpayee in the late 90s, but I think this government has taken it further forward, uh, and that's a physical infrastructure revolution. You know, we were really behind, and we're now beginning to catch up. Then I think the question that uh, our Asked, the digital revolution. I think it's, uh, 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 it's something quite exceptional that's happened in India. And the way to think about it, you know, the many ways of thinking about it, one is that essentially the government has created a non-proprietary platform, as it were, which allows both the government to better deliver services to the poor, uh, uh, you know, uh, via Aadhaar and Jam and all this, but it also has created a platform for the private sector to innovate. And what's special about this is, unlike Apple and thing, it's a non-proprietary platform. You know, anyone, there's a platform, any private sector, it's interoperable, so any private sector person can come and the private sector can talk to each other. And, you know, a, a manifestation of that is, you know, in the last five years, India has created something like 120 unicorns, uh, a $350 billion valuation. So I think that's kind of part of the digital infra. So it both helps the government to deliver services to the poor, and it creates a platform for innovation. So that's the second revolution. The third revolution it builds on that. I think this government, beginning again earlier with previous governments, has... I would say created a revolution in the delivery of a number of essential services like chul, uh, you know, cooking gas, bank accounts, housing, 
toilets, uh, power, water, and of course cash, uh, you know, delivering cash to people. So, so there's a kind of physical infrastructure revolution, there's a digital infrastructure revolution, and there's the, infra the revolution of delivering better services to the poor. So these are the things that create hope for India. On the external side, what's really changed, I think, is geopolitics. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, China that was, you know, attracting the world's investment. I, I think the world has turned against China, but also we should not forget that, you know, China, the Chinese leadership itself is creating a lot of problems within China. And the way to understand it very simply is that, you know, I, I've worked a little bit on China, that I think even about a year ago or 18 months ago, 24 years ago, people said that the long run potential growth rate for China was like 5%. Today, I think most serious people would say is about two to two and a half, three percent. So it's a radical change in the outlook for China, which means, and plus all the U.S. you know the invasion, China's turning thing, the U.S.-China rivalry. Capital is saying, international capital is saying, what are the best alternative locations? And India is appearing very, very promising because Vietnam and Bangladesh and Indonesia cannot quite do things provide the scale that India can. So it's this combination of the internal uh, revolutions begun earlier but taken forward by this government plus the absolute changed geopolitical context that I think one can legitimately say, wow, in, this is, is this India's decay. But uh, three serious caveats. One, to exploit this the government has to have policies that should make India truly an Indian industry and business competitive internationally. Uh, that is not happening because the government is still has a policy. It's very inward looking. It's very nationalist. And, you know, uh, the notion that we can conquer the world, which we need to do by turning inward, uh, is not uh, compatible. Uh, and I've studied this a lot. The Indian government has been raising tariffs. It's very ambivalent. It tr attracts some foreign investment, but other foreigners have been hurt. So it's very ambivalent. So I think uh, it, 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 certainly these policies are changeable. But under current policies, which are very inward looking, I think it's not obvious that we can convert this big opportunity uh, into something real. So that's the first, I think, caveat. Uh, the second caveat, I think, is that um, um, is uh, I want to put this delicately because I think people think uh, that the politics and economics can be divorced. Uh, I think up to a point uh, it's possible, but I think at some stage the, uh, the, uh, the politics will catch up with the economics. If you centralize power, if you, know, you exercise state power arbitrarily, capriciously against some but not the others, eventually investors will also start getting worried. And you know, and the whole level playing field that we have to have with rule of law, non-arbitrary use, I, I think that's something that we have to be very careful and watchful about. Uh, and, and I think there are you know anxieties about that, uh, uh, and, and I think we should be aware of that. The last caveat I would note, you know, kind of coming to the uh, thing about digital, I, I think that. You know, uh, digital is very powerful, very attractive. IT, you know, excellent. It's going to transform welfare, how consumers perceive things, what they benefit. But you have to remember that the IT sector and all these things account for 2 to 3% of the labor force. So if you want to create jobs in India, it cannot be by digital alone. And the whole, and, and if you look at the Indian labor market today, uh, it's it's a bit worrying. You know, you know, uh, unemployment rates have come down, unemployment is going up. There's still a lot of informality. So I think we need to crack the em providing employment for lots of people. And digital, wonderful as it is in its effects 
cannot provide that broad-based prosperity which India needs. So I think, uh, to just to, I've gone on, sorry, just to summarize, great domestic opportunities, great geopolitical external opportunities, but uh, you know, to convert them, we have to be mindful about the three caveats. We cannot turn inward in terms of policy. State power and politics cannot be arbitrary, cannot be majoritarian, must be inclusive, must bring everyone along. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, we need to create employment for you know, millions and millions of people, which digital on its own will not be able to. Well, yeah, just on that last point about the employment, Nivrita, you mentioned 8 million. I believe it's 8 million per year. Per year. So that's the problem, that it's 8, 8 to 10 million per year. <coughs> and China, when it was growing at its, when it had its uh, demographic dividend, had a goal that they had to grow at 10% a year. And they grew at 10% plus a year for 35, two decades. 35 years. Yeah, for, for several years. In India, when I hear about the growth objectives of the coming India decade, it's we can grow at 8%. So, you know, we were having this discussion earlier, and, uh, you know, Naresh, you were making the point. Are we aiming too low? Are we happy? Because the biggest challenge that I see in India is people say, oh, we are the fastest growing economy in the world. It's like saying my five-year-old child is growing faster than your 17-year-old child. That's an irrelevant measure. Growing faster than the U.S. when U.S. per capita GDP is 40 times higher is an irrelevant measure. The question is, what did the other economies that made this leap grow at at this stage of economic development? And that's what we should be aiming for, not being satisfied with we are the fastest growing. As an investor, I love it. It's the best place to invest because it's growing fast relative to other places I can invest. But as an Indian, we should be asking, what did China grow at this stage? What did we have, you know, what did uh, uh, Taiwan, Korea, whatever, pick your, and so the question, Nivruti, for you is, you know, you're on these committees and you're involved with the government. Is the government and is the Indian business aiming too low in terms of where we need to go? Yes, it can be the decade from being the fastest growing major economy, but while we were the fastest growing major economy, Bangladesh overtook us on per capita GDP. So you know what is the uh, what is the uh, risk and the opportunity that we are looking at? Sure, I will answer that. But before that, I'm going to sh throw in some numbers related to uh, you know the answer that uh, uh, Naresh made and Arvind made. The engineer in me was like dying to you know show some numbers. Um, so just to talk about health, I'm I'm very interested in health and technology, and the reason is India has 1.4 billion people. And I'll tell you why I'm saying 1.4 billion people. I'll just give you, you know, how a human body is formed. And I'm interested because I'm trying to see how technology can impact health and why India plays a big part. Human body works with 20 amino acids, only 20. Those amino acids go and make 20 to 800,000 proteins. Those proteins go and make, you know, trillions of cells that make you know, seven, eight tissues that make 79 organs. So this is how your body is formed, from amino acids <coughs> to organs. Now, health uh, professionals are intercepting human body's requirements at every level. Amino acid, you even eat amino acids. When it comes to, uh, you know, proteins, you have insulin, you have hormones. When it comes to cells, you're trying to, you know, your COVID vaccination is reaching your cell. And then your tissues, and then your organs when you transplant. So when you have these many trillions of cells in a human body and 1.4 billion people, the doctors in India are so precious because they have seen variety of these diseases. And therefore, I feel health segment is one where India can power and create value for the world. The, the fact that India is a democratic nation, the fact that India is leveraging data for human good, population scale, responsible uh, development, I really think health segment and Naresh Trehan has a lot to do, not just for India, but for the world. In terms of the platform, just to let you know, again, the usage of this digital platform is by 500 million people. Anytime you talk India, the scale is something that you keep in mind. Anytime you have an idea that you want to flush through, you know, solve the kinks, 
India is a perfect place because it's a clean slate. And the reason I bring this is 79 billion transactions have happened on UPI, which is half of the global MasterCard. So when you come up with an ideation in India and deploy it, the scale teaches you a lot. And I'm not saying it's devoid of challenges, but it teaches you immensely. Now coming back to your point, there are lots of challenges that you know um, there are in India just because it's uh, the largest, one of the largest uh, democracy. Uh, everybody has an idea. Everybody is saying something. Um, people have not seen the innovations that the rest of the world is seeing. But three things that I feel really create growth for a nation. One is you know your diversification of economy. When I'm looking at India, I was recently in Orissa, and I saw in one hand a huge billboard talking about textiles, and on the other, it was talking about steel and its aspirations. By the way, 10% of India's steel comes from Orissa, so of course it had steel. Uh, but then they were talking about manufacturing, they were talking about AI, they were saying, how can I get 100% of Orissa citizens trained on AI? So diversification of economy, people are thinking, not just the government, but the private sector. The second thing I feel is education and skilling of uh, you know, people. And I really think that all of us are witness whether India sees a GDP per capita of $1,500 or whether there are some states that are seeing uh, uh, you know, 10x or 15x of that everybody aspires to grow through education. So I really feel the strength of India is in the workforce and the budding workforce. By the way, while you know, Pratham is doing amazing worldwide, I think India's uh, student population, the w w first through 12th needs to double up. It's half, 165 to 200 million people, whereas China has 400 million. However, when I look at the graduates, and the, uh, the masters and the, the PhDs, India has competitive number as compared to China. So I really think education is a strength that India has and the aspiration of everybody, whether that person is cooking in your house, that person is trying to educate their children. So I really think education is a strength that will eventually meet the aspiration of the country. And lastly, government policies. I have been very vocal in making sure we understand our strengths as well as our weakness. So I was, I'm going to give you one last example. When Gina Raimondo was there and Piyush Goyal were there, they were talking about manufacturing. And I come from Intel and semiconductors. So obviously, my, you know, my uh, two cents were required for, for semiconductor business. And while, to answer Naresh's you know, point we were talking about in, in, the, in the hall prior to this panel, that. India should look at world, a global innovation and cutting edge innovation. I am done with Jugar. India is actually looking at driving innovations for the world. The, the open source platform, when uh, Arvind talked about open source, the fact is how do you enable the people who don't have the affordability of an Amazon to build a very unique closed platform to do their, to their, their uh, e-commerce. India has MSME, which is in million, 63 million or so, and generating 30% of India's GDP. They need to access or they need the market access of the globe. So India builds this you know, ONDC platform on which these MSMEs can house. So India is aware that India needs to power its 1.4 billion people to be able to generate those revenues for themselves and for the nation and for the world. So platforms like ONDC is doing that. And it's not just purely government. It is you know, a Section 8 company. And the awareness is there. So my point is there are challenges. We need to address that. So by the way, the Gina Raimondo example I'm giving you, while I do believe... I think we should just tell them Gina Raimondo who she is. Oh, she's the... She's a, a Commerce Secretary for Commerce Secretary for India, kind of like an equivalent of Piyush Goyal in India. Um, 
She's I, the Commerce Secretary of the U.S. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Commerce Secretary of the U.S. So, so while I do believe for semiconductors, India can dream the cutting edge, which builds these servers for Amazon or builds the laptops that you have the most cutting edge technology, um, two nanometer. Uh, your hair can have you know like several thousands of those transistors. However, reality is there are a lot of challenges. Like I said, you know, with water, with power, with land, with local demands, cell phones cannot meet all of those demands. Cars cannot meet all of those demands that is required to pipe clean this fab. So what my approach was, with a crawl strategy, can we build a virtual fab? India is amazing with software. India is amazing with mathematical analysis. Growing up, my father would say, if you don't do math, you will not succeed in life. That's how you know, I grew up. So math is important, software is important, analysis is important. So my suggestion to Gina, Raimondo, and Piyush Goel was, can we build a virtual fab? If you're going to compete with China by building a fab in Germany, you have to figure out ways to come up with you know, a strategy where you can beat a low cost Taiwan or a China. So can you leverage these AI experts, these analysts who can come up with fab analysis such that you, know, you can get to do optimization much better? So answer is yes. I am very hopeful because from my perspective, I know the challenges. But I also know the strength. So I want to leverage this strength, and I want to seek uh, help from, from the globe in terms of capital, in terms of innovation, because tailwinds are only limited. If you don't maximize the benefit that India has with the tailwinds, we're going to lose it yet again. So therefore, the fact that Arvind called all of us here tells me, you know, India is there in the game. So I'm, I'm very hopeful and no, excited. That's great, great answer. Thank you. So one last question for me. I know we want to leave some time for audience questions. You mentioned AI. Generative AI is the buzz of the moment uh, around the world. Uh, it's expected to be extremely disruptive, but also potentially extremely exciting in improving productivity, whether it's in healthcare in terms of much faster drug development or it's in you know, uh, helping automate tasks, which is going to cause some major dislocations. And when people talk about the AI race, they talk about US versus China. India is not even in the picture. And yet you've mentioned AI. I was at a conference, India conference today, and they were talking about the opportunities for India. So you know, is, uh, is, is AI an opportunity or a threat? For me, I really think AI is an opportunity. I'm the believer that the opportunity cost, if you don't do AI, is, is going to be so bad for the world, you'll miss millions of people who could have you know, been treated, like uh, you know, uh, Naresh Trehanji can treat somebody sitting uh, in uh, well, Timbuktu. I was going to ask Naresh also his view on, on the AI opportunity and, 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 uh, and how India can leverage that in, in, in your opinion. So you know, the only downside or fear of AI is where will it stop? Mm -hmm. okay. is it, many years ago, I saw a film Ex Machina. Yeah. I don't know how many of you saw it, but this was basically 10, 15 years ago, or 10 years ago at least, that what it did was that this scientist had created this whole lab in, in his own environment somewhere in the mountains and was creating AI for robotics and creating humanoids, right? Till one day, one of them, she fell in love with it. And she got so jealous that she destroyed all the other robots and set the place on fire and he also died with it. So that's where people are raising the, the warning sign to say, is it, if unbridled, can it go to a level where it develops emotion and other aspects of human uh, traits <clears throat> which can be conflicting? And if that happens, then what will be the end result? That's the danger part. But the good part is, till we reach that stage, there is a whole runway for using AI in an amazing way. So today, if you look at we have been doing some work on reading x-rays. 
that it has reached a point where 93% of the x-rays are read better by AI than by a human being. So you, its contribution in medicine is going to be huge, no question about that. But where will it stop? We, we don't know. But one, coming back to India, forget about AI. Coming back to India, there are two actually major disadvantages we have. One is that we get satisfied very quickly. We are very complimentary to ourselves. You do a little bit and you say, oh great, you know, I have achieved this. The world is moving at the speed of lightning. We have a huge burden to carry, 101.5 billion people or 1.4, whatever the data is, is not an easy job. What I must compliment the current government with has done is, they have defined the top line of what it takes to build a nation for the first time. So you know you have clean, uh, such a Bharat, uh, Swastha Bharat, I mean clean, healthy India, made in India, heal from India, heal in India. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> blame it on New York air. <laughs> so, you, you brought it from Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> I should be used to it, but I, I don't know why. I'm reacting badly. So the basic thing is that having defined the top line, how do you drill down uniformly to build a nation from bottom up and up down? We do not understand that innovation is not one institution, one organization. Innovation comes from collaborative work. There is no laboratory unless you have the full ecosystem, you, it, it is very difficult to actually innovate. So there are two things. One, you must have hunger for, for that next step. You must want to climb the mountain on a daily basis and then we will get there. What is the blessing for India? We have one of the best brains in the world. If you, if you had any doubt, you, you see our kids on TV uh, winning the uh, spelling B, <laughs> beating everybody and uniformly, every year on year, month on month. So you know we have the brains. We need the organization. For many years we blamed it on our colonial uh, hangover, but that excuse is not there anymore. So now we have to really transform our thinking into being like we always take pride in the fact that we are the pharmacy to the world. But actually, if the truth is, we are copycats. Mm -hmm. So you wait for some molecule to come off patent and we say, yeah, now we can, we are the manufacturers of cheaper drugs. Yeah, that's nothing wrong with that. But for how many years are you going to stay there for 25 years and get satisfied with the fact that you are making enough money, but you're not reinvesting it into the next steps and the next steps. So you need to be bold, you need to be thinking ahead and India, absolutely can be the leader, no question about that. And I'm glad the current dispensation of our government is that India has pride, we can be there and let us build, build out there. Now, how we spread the message, like it has been enumerated already, we need the skills, we can, I think the greatest opportunity India has is that we can be the human capital supplier to the world. Because wherever you go, the Indian diaspora, at whatever level they entered any country, they have been the most reliable workers you can find. They are intelligent, they are non-political, they don't make trouble, and if you travel, I, I, I just recently I was invited to, to one of the Middle Eastern countries, and the population is three million. The Amir had invited me to look at the healthcare system. And he told me himself, he said, there are one million of us out of the three million. The next million is all Indians. <laughs> and then the third million is the rest of the world. So he said, we would, we would give an arm and a leg to get more Indians here. So if you can find us more, more Indians who want to move to Kuwait, please do. Because he said, we find them the best workers and best citizens in that environment. So if we have that advantage, 
then why do we not leverage that in in ways which refers to both of the other my co-panelists is the fact that you near really need to skill them skill them for the world skill them focused for the world and i think that's one of the opportunities we should not miss because on the other other side of the coin is that there is huge shortage of good human capital which is trained for the jobs and skills that are needed around the world thanks so uh, uh, Arvind, uh, you know uh, uh, i cannot at a pratham sponsored event uh, let the notion that india has this uh, you know has the human capital to beat the world i i i cannot let that pass uh, right. one of the yes biggest no, no I, I, let me give you we are, we are not that as good as i think we are no, no, no. Not even. Uh, let, let me explain. Not even remotely. Uh, let me. Really? Uh, okay. Yeah. That's uh, my education. Yeah. Uh, so, so <coughs> one of the major, major contributions of Pratham and Asar, uh, and you know, we have to you know take it in the right spirit. Is that us? Uh, Pratham has been conducting what's called the annual survey of education report. Uh, and they've been doing it now for about 15, 16 years. Uh, for the first time, what they did was, I mean, 15 years ago, they would actually go to uh, you know, almost every primary school in rural India and conduct these things on learning, just you know, reading and math uh, outcomes. Um, for 15 years in India, uh, learning outcomes on education and math, basic, uh, have completely sta have been stagnant, and they've been stagnant at levels of the following: a five-year or uh, uh, a fifth-grade student uh, can, or, or let me say something. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know the exact number, uh, but something like a fifth-grade, typical fifth-grade student, about. 40 to 50 percent of them maximum can do second grade learning, etc. And this has been true for 20, 25 years. And one of India's biggest failings has been at human cap in human capital. And therefore, I think we should be careful because on the one hand, uh, I'm sure there are pockets that uh, Naresh uh, and you deal with you know, at the very high end of the spectrum where India does brilliantly. But uh, just as in employment, you know, we need to provide employment for 70%, our education for, for the, we fail our children, about 70, 80% of them, uh, you know, massively and for the last 20 years. And that's why organizations like Pratham have taken upon this task of how do we improve this. So, so let us not get triumphalist about our human capital because these are the basic facts which Pratham has highlighted. Just yeah. let, me, let, me, let me just add to that. The idea is you're right that we have failed the children but the children failed. Yeah. Well, I, my, my statement is that we do have the brains. When given the opportunity, we run the mile faster than most. I also am the chairman of, for 10 years I was, I just stepped down, as the chairman of Health Sector Skill Council. So given the opportunity, we have trained over 100,000 GDAs who are people who were having trouble passing 10th grade. Just killing them for that particular purpose, they have become excellent at it. And, and hospitals want them to hire them over everybody else. So I'm saying that there is need and Pratham is doing a fantastic job. That's why I'm here, otherwise I won't accept this. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay. I so, just... well, so there's no dispute on that. But the point is that yes, we, are, we need to multiply that and the government actually has to step in there because the private sector will not, we can only help. We are just can apply the bomb, but we cannot replace the, the system. So uh, I'll I, answer I, two lines, the generative AI, yeah. because I didn't, didn't answer. What I love about generative AI is you've all seen it has given you the ability to chat. Now, generative AI is built of trillions of parameters, and parameters are different definitions. If you're looking at a cat, an ear could be a parameter and so on. What ex is exciting about this generative AI is 
people like us you me people in india anywhere you know uh, can build a smaller model of let's say just a billion parameters and fine tune the, their parameters for their specific use cases. So what is exciting is it is like an open source platform, this open AI, on which you can build your own and this enables democratization of leveraging this uh, you know, AI platforms over which anybody, any startup can build. And I'm looking forward to many such startups from, from US and all over the world and India especially. So I, I don't know if we, I know we were supposed to end at 7.30, but if we have time, we'll, 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 okay, we'll take a couple of questions from the audience. I know we can talk amongst ourselves all the time, but so, I want to allow for some questions. Alvin, I'll have to be excused in five, because I okay. catch a flight. Okay. Please, uh, we have people asking questions here in front. Somebody can pass the mic over there. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name, my name is Nami Kaur, and I'm representing Gopio, the global Indian diaspora here. First of all, I want to thank Asia Society and an excellent panel. This was just so amazing. I have two questions, a little unrelated. The first one is, as we go into these three revolutions that you talked about, what about the majority uh, of India? I mean, we always talk about the middle class and upward. I don't know the percentages. But at what cost do these revolutions happen? Who gets disenfranchised in this process, uh, in the infrastructure, digital, etc.? In other words, who gets left behind? That's my first question. And the second one is more forward thinking about AI. Um, is India part of the consortium that is being formed regarding planning, just like for the nuclear proliferation, because we have been we're thinking of AI as is it, is it, is the same powerhouse as what we did in the 1939s about the nuclear weapons. So I just wanted to know whether India is very much in the dialogue for that consortium. Hi, hi, you want to go, sir? I've been a minute. Um, I, I leave the second question to, to uh, on the first one, who gets uh, left behind? I, I think physical infrastructure benefits everyone. Um, I, I think the, uh, uh, especially the Modi government's, you know, uh, uh, attempt at delivering all these goods to uh, people, you know, such Bharat, toilets, bank accounts, uh, cash. I think that is truly inclusive. So that the aim of that is not to leave people behind. And Ayushman is another. And Ayushman. So I think that's a really inclusive uh, uh, attempt. Uh, the problem comes with the digital thing, that I think the digital thing uh, risks excluding people not because of what it's doing, but because of what are the other things we're not doing to complement that. And, you know, education is one example. So that's how I would, I think, think of uh, exclusion, uh, the left behind question. Right. On AI, India is actually building an AI policy uh, and looking at, you know, trying to cover for the validation, the verification, the testing, and the audit, such that those bugs, bias, malware uh, kind of issues don't happen uh, with the AI application. And the good thing is, the government is actually seeking the private sector expertise to come up with such policies. So I'm really excited about how the government has accepted that the strength of technology often does not lie with the government, but the people outside of the government. And they've created such a consortium to drive such policies. And the few policies I am involved in is in reducing road accidents. India has 1% cars on the road and 11% of the world deaths due to traffic accidents. The second thing I'm involved is in health, so diagnostics of breast cancer, bone degeneration, ret retinopathy, some policies around that. So what is exciting is the government is understanding the gaps and trying to address. Are we ready? Not yet, but yeah. that's the process. Uh, just to uh, factual information, remember neither the US nor Europe uh, nor anyone else has actually evolved a kind of regulatory framework domestically nor internationally for this. It's all up in the air. So, you know, it's not every country has to come up with its own, and then maybe there will be some international cooperation based on that. But we're very far away from that. Okay. 
Uh, Vaibha Parikh from Nishit Desa Associates. We are an Indian law firm. Um, uh, my question is, uh, we all have been talking about China plus one and especially manufacturing. Manufacturing will be very important to meet the uh, job growth which India needs. Uh, the question really is that can we compare ourselves to China when it comes to productivity and the cost of manufacturing? Because uh, you know, it's nice to say that you know China plus one will, people will look out for. But if the cost of economics of China is so low per unit, and if we are not close to that, will it last? And that's the question I had. Well, uh, and I would add a little bit to that. I think you know, again, t t agreeing with Arvind Subramanian and one of the challenges is I think McKinsey had done this work uh, seven or eight years ago, looking at the auto industry as it developed in China versus in India. And India has much higher level of automation in manufacturing yes. versus China at a much, much lower labor cost today because of the lack of productivity of labor and the lack of skill training of labor at the manufacturing level. So has it changed enough? So we are talking about this make in India, but that challenge in manufacturing that existed there's a labor law component, but there was a more important component with you know, people like Bharat Ford and others which just said that you know, we can't, we have to use more automation. You were gonna so so, so uh, let me just uh, respond. So the f first thing to note is that uh, it was precisely because of what you said that India never, in, India missed the manufacturing boat completely, right? In the past, uh, our share of, uh, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing employment is amongst the lowest, you know, uh, amongst comparable countries. But the question today is, uh, is there a change that we can exploit because China is becoming uncompetitive? So it's the kind of delta that we need to focus on. And some of the positive delta is what uh, you were saying you know the infrastructure is improving uh, you know the the digital is improving the platforms uh, some states are in fact changing labor laws uh, in order to attract this investment and recognizing that we need to do more delta the government is actually giving subsidies you know in, a, in fact very specifically to compensate for you know all the other problems that we have uh, had in the past so the open question now is whether all these positive deltas that have been done are sufficient to overcome a kind of almost a congenital handicap we've had because of you know uh, uh, labor costs being very high infrastructure still not being our connectivity not being very good and I think that's the open question I think and my um, my own sense is that if we can show that you know Apple Intel etc are actually able to create a lot of jobs uh, you know uh, by exporting becoming internationally competitive maybe that can create a kind of you know kind of momentum and, uh, and a kind of dynamism and you know building upon this which can then change uh, you know what has happened in the past but we need some demonstration effects that yes you know Apple Intel whatever all the other things uh, can actually reverse uh, a 25 30 year old uh, a record of non-performance on this. I'll give two examples, like, you know, just following up from Arvind. Uh, things are changing. And I'll give you my Intel example. So firstly, Intel, uh, I am the country president for Intel in India, and we have uh, more than 30,000 employees, engineering employees, which is just next to US. Second thing is, the supply chain diversification, either with geopolitics or in general also diversify, diversifying such that you're not held, held hostage to one country is happening. I'll give you one example. In a laptop, there is something called Wi-Fi module that enables you to connect to you know, your Wi-Fi. That Wi-Fi module for Intel, what we did is we leveraged a company in Haryana, a really small company. And we built you know, some pilot parts. We came and tested in Folsom. The parts were amazing. They were so amazing and such good cost that Intel decided to move 15% of their uh, you know, Wi-Fi module to this one little company. And 15% is many more millions per month that we are building. Uh, second thing is, you know, I talked about Tata acquiring uh, Vistron and Reliance acquiring Sanmina. 
we have as Intel leveraged these companies to build, and also local companies, to build printed circuit boards. So Intel is also looking at you know, leveraging India for manufacturing. The challenge that Arvind talked about, I agree, is the scale. I'm moving 10%, 15% of these building blocks to India. Can I move 85%? No, it's going to be a crawl, walk, run journey. But the change has begun. A small company, since this is not going to be published outside, I can tell you it's a company based in Haryana that we are using. And it's doing amazing. But only 10, 10% is what I'm moving. But I do want to see other companies you know, coming up. Thank you. Well, I think we have to wind it up here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to both my panelists. Uh,